alumni, professors, and MCI staff, all the speakers and audience all over the world, guten tag. Welcome to the MCIT Forum 2022. My name is Michaela Yiting, currently studying at Management, Communication and IT in MCI at Entrepreneur University as master student. Now I'm very honored and pleasant to be the genuine chairperson of the conference this year. First of all, please allow me on behalf of the MCIT department to thank you all for your participation today. All of us at MCI the Entrepreneur University in Innsbruck, Austria is sending our best and sincerest greetings and wishes to you. The MCIT Forum is an online conference hosted by the Master's Program Pro Management Communication and IT of the MCI. During the conference, we, brought, we bring thought leaders and young professionals together. We invite international companies to meet future graduates and provide insights into exciting research fields of the MCI for a mutual and fruitful exchange. Besides, we provide a unique opportunity for networking and knowledge exchange for young professionals and the disruptive thinkers. As this is one online event, you can easily give your speech and for, for home and we directly reach out to our international community. So next, let's warmly welcome Professor Dr. Professor Miski. The head, of our, the head of our MCIT Department of Studies to give us a nice greeting and the opening to this conference. Welcome. Yeah, welcome also from my side. Thank you so much, Michaela. Um, and uh, hello from Innsbruck. Hello from Innsbruck, Tirol. We have a very, very nice weather. It's sun, a sunny, a sun shining day. Uh, the best day even to welcome all of you online. Um, and as you know, from the years before, this has been an online event, also before the pandemic, just because of the reason that we have now, we're celebrating our 20th birthday of the department. We now have 1,000 alumni all over the world, and it is so much easier to stay in contact, to build a network, and to get this wonderful inspiration uh, directly at home or at work at your fingertips um, watching our online conference. But nevertheless, it uh, would be nice to have you here. And this is also always an open invitation to come back into our office, meet us and greet us for, for example, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Good morning. Thank you so much. You know um, already that this event annually is organized, created, and inspired by our master students, who are, I would say, strongly contributing also to the topic of digital transformation, which is the topic of our department in management, communication, and IT, as well as digital business and software engineering. And looking uh, to this very topic, which is also the name of our research unit, digital transformation, uh, from different perspectives is meaning also bearing in mind that we are all not able to travel or just beginning to travel again also to take an international perspective on the digital transformation which is happening all over and is even boosted for example by the pandemic this year we will have this look to digital business in asia and i'm very much looking forward to all these, I would say, fantastic speakers. Thank you also from my side beforehand um, for their input. Looking forward to your contributions, to your questions. So bear in mind, this is, as always, uh, an invitation to communicate, to ask, to discuss, exchange your opinions. Um, and um, also to our panel discussion, which is then coming up in the afternoon, where we once again also a little bit on site, to be honest, discuss uh, this digital transformation worldwide with a specific focus on Asia. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Um, enjoy the day and all the best for um, the upcoming hours. And thank you so much for um, giving me the, I would say, the first uh, opportunity to open up 
this wonderful MCIT Forum 2022. Yes. Here you go, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miski. So as most of you already know, this year's topic is digital business in Asia. How is the digital business conducted in Asia? In Asia, as elsewhere, the digital revolution is sweeping all the industry from retail and banking, from manufacturing and transportation. Therefore, the conference this year will highlight how the companies in the Asia Pacific region are tackling the digital transformation. We've prepared and invite seven outstanding se sessions and speakers for you today. Some of them are MCIT graduates who are currently engaged in working involving the region of Asia and Europe. Some are prospective graduates of MCIT who want to share his and her Asian exchange experience with you. Some are the outstanding experienced experts and professors in the industry, guiding you into the professional fields and bringing you into the unique insights and ideas to let you understand and know this Asian business better and deeper. After the sessions, the 40 minutes he did the panel discussion is waiting for you. Mr. Minsky will moderate again, together with two professors from MCI, which are Professor Dr. Deepak Kasanchi and Professor Dr. Wei Maskawan. The panel discussion today is outsourcing digital business to Asia, still an opportunity or not? Sounds quite challenging and interesting. Hmm. Then you definitely shouldn't miss it out. During the conference, there are big and small networking events such as quick Q&A and so on. The winners can get nice and delicate gifts from MCI shop. And at the end of the sessions, we set off a super big lucky draw. <laughs> Enter the sweepstakes according to the rules for a chance to win the latest publication in Color Magazine by the industry expert, Mrs. Tobias Lloyd. Well, not so much to say. Let's start it with our first guest today, our dear keynote speaker, Manuela Hannes Han Aimei. It's a really nice Chinese name. Emmanuel Hannes is a strategy consultant, trainer, and the speaker for cooperation and communication with Chinese partners <laughs> from an intercultural and strategic, strategic perspective. She has a lot of experience and know how to successfully build strategic cooperation with China. Emmanuel collaborates its so-called Silk Road 4.0 event to promote new technologies and connect Europe and China. Furthermore, she also published several scientific journals. Today, she will give us a 40 minutes keynote speech titled Agility Instead of Perfection, Different Perspective and What We Can Learn From and About China. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yiting, for this nice uh, introduction. Can you tell me, can you hear me all? Is my voice clear? It's super wonderful. Yes. Thank you. So after such a nice introduction, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me for this incredible event. Uh, speaking at an anniversary is always a special like honor. And also, I have to congratulate the MCIT, the whole team uh, for their professionalism, their engagement and the wonderful schedule and agenda that you have drawn up. I feel really, really honored to contribute to this whole situation and to this, um, yeah, to this event. I am now starting yes. to... Yes. I think you can share the screen now. Yes. So, I am... Starting to share my screen. So you have to let me share the screen, they say. Mm, I'll give you the rights. So there's one super small icon at the bottom of the screen. It's like a whiteboard. Okay. Yes. So just a second. Okay, sorry. So, trying again. Can you give it to me again? Okay, of course. Here you go. So, I have to let you share the screen. Why is it not working? I don't know. Mm, what about this? No, I can't. Um, it is not working as I'm, um, as I'm oh. used. Can you tell me how I can enter the whole thing? Um, did you see four icons at the bottom of the screen of this platform? Yes, yes and it is gray. 
It is gray. Mm -hmm. A moment, Peter. Yes, sorry. If not, I can just talk. It's also okay. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Might you try now again? Did you see the icon? Mm -hmm. I see the icon and it's still gray. Still gray? Okay. Can you, can, could you maybe share my presentation because I sent it to you? Yes, it is. Maybe our tech team people will, will solve it very fast. I'm super sorry. Thank you for your support. It's fine. So what I would like to take the time, maybe the best is to just start and to introduce a little bit my topic. Um, because then already we can make best use of the time. I think that's the best situation. Okay. Um, my topic of today is agility instead of perfection. And I am starting the day, I feel really honored to start the day with a bit of an input from a more cultural perspective. So um, I have seen that on your ag agenda, you have a lot of digitalization experts, which is awesome. What I like to do is um, give a bit the perspective from what are the cultural backgrounds of the whole thing. Because oftentimes um, I work with companies that are a bit confused and uh, that are asking me, so what is, the, what is the main difference and how can we adapt to the Chinese style of digitalization, of transformation, of market organization that we can understand. This is why um, during the last years I started to research on the Chinese digital uh, digitalization strategies and try to find out what is standing behind it and what concept from the West can we employ to better understand it and to make best use of it and also to be inspired and to learn from it as much as possible. Um, you already introduced me really well. Thank you very much for all of these kind words. Um, I see that now you are uh, sharing the screen. Wonderful, I can employ it. Thank you so much. About me, I'm a China observant researcher since 2008. You already said everything that is important. I am working as a consultant trainer and I public, uh, publicize a lot of different um, topics, especially focused on strategy, culture and communication. I had the honor to work in many different uh, political and diplomatic uh, positions. And in my YouTube channel, you can find a lot of more China insights and analysis if you're interested in what I am telling you today. So starting with what I just said, um, again and again from my work, I can see and I can feel, and the data also shows that the most crucial factor for innovation, which is the basis for digitalization, for the transformation that we are seeing at the moment, all around the globe, but especially strong in China, is culture. Um, I interviewed a consultancy also for innovation and culture, who is an outstanding expert in the US. He also agreed that the most crucial factor for innovation is culture and cultural patterns of societies and individuals. And I think this is a very helpful approach if we want to understand what is happening in China and how we can learn and profit from it. One of the first examples to dive right in, culture and innovation. We have seen that um, the self-driving market in China has literally exploded. Um, the first reports in 2018 were only 56 self-driving vehicles that started with testing runs around the streets of China, 150,000 kilometers. Already in August 2021, we have seen favorable policies from the government and that immediately led to Deep Root AI, for example, uh, releasing the driverless taxis in Shenzhen, additional fleets of L4 level um, automatic vehicles, which is a very high level of automation and um, uh, also in Shenzhen. Pony AI and Baidu also have their projects and their taxis riding around Beijing and in Guangzhou. This is a very short time frame and a lot of experts from the industries that I have interviewed said that it was possible in China because of the culture and because of the openness to innovation and the openness and flexibility to something new. If we go to marketing, 
Um, most of the experts who work in the field of automatic vehicles, for example, and also e-vehicles, keep telling me again and again that a, a very large percentage of the Chinese population and enterprises belong to the early adopter mindset. Right? So from marketing, we have these different mindsets. How long does it take for the mass market to adopt something? And a large percentage of the Chinese population are early adopters or feel very comfortable to adopt new technology very early. Um, this together with a huge market that we already know about um, translates into the numbers that we have and also the speed of the uh, transformation that we can see. Figuratively speaking, uh, it is uh, calculated that by 2013, 60% of the taxis that will be hailed in China will be robo-taxis, meaning self-driving automated vehicles. And the market size is prog prognosed, like the prognosis for the market size, I'm sorry, is 1.3 trillion yuan. This is, on one hand, of course, due to the large market size, but very strongly also, as I have just told you, to the early adoption mindset, to the mindset that new technology is something interesting and to be tried out. Um, this can be a challenge and uh, something very, very positive. Um, for my work, I have also interviewed more than 30 companies in Germany, in Austria and Switzerland about their cooperation with Chinese partners, about their experience on the Chinese market. And again and again, the number one challenge that they tell me is flexibility. The number one challenge they're facing is the flexibility of the Chinese market, the flexibility of their Chinese partners. With this, they mean the uncertainty, flexibility in meaning uncertainty is the number one challenge. The number one admired point or specific point or also reason why they're going into this market or why they're successful in this market is also the flexibility. With this, usually they mean the speed and the ease with which things are being implemented in China. And basically what I want to, uh, to emphasize is that both are just different sides of the same coin. Flexibility can be a challenge, of course, if we work together, but can be a huge inspiration and also a huge like pathway for us to how we can improve our innovation and our innovation pathways. So going one step back to the Chinese culture, we can find interesting like different layers and different patterns and different philosophies that all emphasize order and flexibility. We, when we, if we start with Confucian principles, we find a lot about hierarchy and order. And these principles are also still very much alive in Chinese business, as lots of my colleagues, like Dr. Niedenfür, for example, have researched on. We also find Buddhism, for example, that strongly uh, repeats that all things are impermanent, the importance of self-development, non-violence. A lot of strategic basics that are classics in the Chinese literature, like war without losses, strategic planning, all these concepts that you can find in Sunzi, for example, in 36 Stratagems, and in many, many other works. The next one, which is the paramount underlying principle for agility and flexibility, is the Taoist uh, philosophy. Uh, the philosophy of being like water, waiting for the right moment, like as in, expressed in Wu Wei, not always acting all the time, but waiting for the right moment, adapting to change and using it to your benefit, right? So the direction is clear, but you adapt to change and you use it to your benefit. This is something that the whole Chinese market is extremely strong in. If you um, have a look again at all the developments of the next years, you will see these underlying principles almost everywhere. So from Tencent to Ping An, which are two of the examples uh, that I also had a look at, uh, China's way of tackling digital transformation and innovation is uh, a very interesting and inspiring way to, to tackle these topics. Western corporations and companies increasingly look to China for inspiration. I will have the example of also Elon Musk, who more and more <laughs> talks about China as an example for what he wants to do. And there is a reason that he started in China, that he started building his gigafactory in China first and then in Germany. Again, 
this proclivity to flexibility, to adapting to change, also for the autonomous vehicles, if we uh, go back to that, um, experts said that, for example, a lot, of, a lot of testing has been done in Chinese cities, even though the traffic is so large and so chaotic, because people react more flexibly. So if things go wrong, people just go out of the way. You are not expected, people don't expect everybody to behave exactly perfectly in traffic. So they are very self-reliant, self-responsible and move out of the way, which made a lot of test runs also, for example, for drones and for robot taxis, a lot easier than, for example, in the very coordinated streets of, let's say, Innsbruck, for example, which is one of my favorite cities. Everything is very coordinated and behaves in a manner that we expect it to behave. If something happens out of the manner we expect, then it's, it's very strange and people do not like to adapt to it. And it's very hard then to introduce new factors. So in the, in, especially in the region of Germany and Austria, we wait for developments to be already very, very far advanced before we test it in populations, in cities, with, amongst other people. Whereas in China, that happened very, very quickly. And we can learn from that. If we look, have a look, for example, at Tencent's business model, uh, it's on purpose that it's so big. You don't have to read all of it. You don't have to read even a bit of it. The most important is that it started in 1998 with QQ, which was a mere messenger service, very similar to we, what we have with WeChat. Mm, some of it was also used already in the West, but very little of it, to be honest. We had ICQ, but that was not the biggest success. And step by step over the year, they incorporated more and more and more industry fees and more and more in revenue streams. So when they started using, for example, their payment functions, which was as early as 2016, um, nobody in the West could even think of paying with a QR code or something like that. But they started very early to include all of these functions and they started very early to do a lot of research. So if you see at the bottom, I think this you can read well, we have the QQ era, which was a bit, you could say, the testing uh, time. They tested out what was possible, what do people uh, accept. QQ already had the video function, they already had a lot of the chat functions, they already had the playing functions the gaming functions. Then you have an expansion time, the platform expansion, which was from 2005 to 2010, where they deliberately expanded their platform and included more and more other features. Very quickly after that, already 2010 to 15, they started the Waste in WeChat area, which completely like <laughs> uh, transformed the whole landscape also with a lot of testing. They started testing small, uh, small features, small possibilities, and saw how people react to it. Of course, also due to the large Chinese market, they gathered a lot of data with it. So we can see here already the topic of my speech, the not going in with perfection, not going in after 20 years of research, but going in with small testing cases, trying out what people accept, and then roll it out in a big style. And in the last area, you can see the investment era from 2015 to the present, where they really incorporated a lot of research, invested a lot, especially in AI, as we will see, and now more or less are active in almost all business fields. Um, we can also see from this slide that from the companies with over $10 billion in net, uh, they are one of the lowest companies or one of the companies who have the lowest income only via revenues. So we can see that Alphabet, for example, Google, YouTube, Meta and so on, Alibaba is an exception, but most of the Western companies get their major income and their major revenues from ads which is not what Tencent is focusing on, right? So they are very diverse. They take a lot of different opportunities and they're not basing on one single source or one major source of income. This is also one of the success factors and is also due to the cultural background um, of employing many different approaches. Um, this is an average user's day on WeChat. I think all of us already have WeChat, so I don't have to walk you through all the walks of it. Also, this is from 2017, so a lot of 
additional options have been included. But what it shows is that basically from waking up to the evening, you can use, you can design your whole day around WeChat and that is the revenue that Tencent is generating. In the West, all the, even the, the even, um, uh, the messenger services that we employ are far from covering all of these different services and are also far from having this innovation spirit of uh, including completely new options like booking flights or like uh, paying, for example. So what does Tencent do? Tencent in, uh, invests a tremendous amount of money in R&D, especially on AI. Their mission is not only to improve their, their platform, right? Their mission is to enhance the quality of human life. That's what they say through internet services. They actively advance the state of art in the field and apply AI to a wealth of products. Um, they are also committed to creating a more resilient planet. So here you can see that they are doing a lot more than just staying in their own field. They want to solve global key challenges. They are now working on food supply technology, employing their AI R&D results. They are working on energy creation. They are working on water management. So again, think of this whole big chart of all of their business fields. Um, this is a very typical culture-based approach to innovation that we will employ what we have for everything that is possible and everything that needs improvement, not only our very close like uh, business scope. They invest heavily on frontier technology. So uh, again, machine learning, natural language processing, computer vision, speech recognition. Meta is also doing that, but they started very late and also they are mainly focused on their own business scope. Where, whereas, as I showed you, Tencent is doing research on everything from water management to like literally every imaginable business field that you can have. So how can we learn from this? We can learn from this, like Elon Musk, for example, we can see that also for the West, this is a model. I took Elon Musk because, not because I like him, but because he is one of the symbols of innovation and disruption in the West. And Elon Musk started Twittering and, and talking about China quite a lot in the last months, even though now with the scaling, there's this little problem. But he keeps telling that the West needs a WeChat style super app that includes all the, all the, uh, things that uh, WeChat has and that provides it to the Western population because he said he can't believe that we actually don't have that yet. If you're in China, you kind of live on WeChat. It does everything. Yeah, it's like Twitter plus PayPal plus a whole bunch of other things, he said, all rolled into one with a great interface. Um, I can't believe we don't have anything like that outside of China. So he said that he was doing that or he was planning to do that. Now let's see how that goes on with his Twitter acquisition. But what it shows us is that you have a tremendous movement and a tremendous um, mass of early adopters that adopt these kind of technologies. You have companies that start very early with minimum viable products, viable products and who go into the market very quickly and who test so much so in the end they get the results that they need to have this great interface to have all of these um, like parts of the of the program I'm sorry I'm missing the word that users really accept and really need really want and that gives them an incredibly broad revenue range if we're moving to ping and very quickly just to give you a third like view into the ecosystem ping an is an insurance company it's based in shenzhen which is one of the incubator re regions of china as you probably know maybe you pro you also know that but i really like to stress the importance of the case study of ping an because ping an is one of the most innovative insurance companies in the world it's officially recognized by those who know it as an example of benchmark for other insurance companies. Why is that? Right? So where in the West do we have an insurance company that has a benchmark for other companies? Well, their approach is that they're strongly based on technology and AI. So they have around 20,000 just tech staff, just developers, just front-end, back-end developers, AI researchers, and so on. 
So they're working with a lot of digital models for health and insurance sector that are absolutely innovative. What does that mean? So why is that great for anybody? Uh, one of the applications that is absolutely mind-blowing, especially coming from Germany or Austria, where we know how long bureaucracy can take, if you have a car accident uh, on the street in China, processing your accident, you take a video or a picture with your smartphone and it is processed within minutes. It is sent, linked directly to the insurance company and reimbursed sometimes in hours. So it means you don't have to fill out an insurance form, you don't have to call insurances, you don't have to hang in the helpline, you don't have to wait for somebody to tell you what maybe eventually, let's see, you don't have to drive into a garage, file in police reports, send in police reports somewhere. You just take a video of the scene, take a video of your damage and you get the report within minutes with confirmations and you get reimbursements within hours, even if it's not within hours, even within days is still light speed. So this is something where we can see clearly that Chinese um, development takes something that is a pain point, not only for the consumers, not only for us who want to receive our money, but also for the company because it involves so much paperwork and it involves so many different steps. Uh, of the insurance agents and puts it together into a win-win situation for both. And this is really, really innovative and very fascinating. So what can China teach us in this whole topic? Um, I find again and again when I'm looking at this topic and we will see also today through the whole day, ideals of agility instead of perfection, right? Ideals of we just start, we just see what happens, we do not even pretend to start perfectly. Whereas the mindset, again, the most important thing for, for innovation is the cultural mindset and patterns. The mindset, especially in German speaking countries is we do so much analysis before we even go to market. Um, adaptation instead of stagnation. So they took a lot of opportunities during the COVID lockdown to improve on many of their services, not only gradually, but really to completely transform them. We will hear a lot about this today from other experts who are more like experts on digitalization itself, but also the ideas of lifelong learning and of testing, of trying things out, not being scared of failing. I think this is very liberating for many uh, companies in the West that are often stagnating. I have also worked for governments, which is the same thing. If you, if you look at governments, they are analyzing topics so long uh, until sometimes the topic has already passed by the time you have the law. Um, and I think that in our world that we have now, in this very VUCA world, we need different approaches to innovation, different, different approaches to how we can transform our lives and our technology, our markets and so on. Uh, so the Chinese approach to innovation is the first thing that we can see clearly is the, the, the value of copying. And I know that this is a very like uh, debated topic uh, because a lot of Chinese uh, manufacturers are being uh, like are being accused of stealing patents and so on. But actually, again, from the cultural mindset, yeah, not from the law, but from the cultural mindset, copying is the first step for learning and innovation. So if you look at babies, if you look at small children, the first thing they do is they copy what the other people do. And then when they have all the tools set ready, then they start to innovate. You can also relate that to the Chinese language. Chinese students use years of their lives to repeat the Chinese science, to copy it again and again, to repeat writing the science. At least they used to, I'm not even sure if they still do that. But the copying first, until you have your tools really right, until you know how to really write these signs, until you really know how something works, and then start to innovate, is a very central approach to innovation. And it's oftentimes overlooked, right? And it's oftentimes seen with a bit of like this copycat. Um, but at the end, at the moment, we see a huge transformation in the global development market that more and more, it's not China copying from the West, more and more companies t are, keep telling me they start copying from the Chinese. Right? So we have this phase at the moment where the copying is more or less over 
And now the innovation has started and now they're putting into place and they're putting into work what they have learned. Another approach that I think we could greatly benefit from, especially in the digitalization market, is embrace the change, right? Going with the flow. All the companies who have used COVID to their benefits and who have employed the new opportunities that it has given have thrived. A lot of companies could not do that because they were not able to embrace the change. A lot of trial and error, which uh, I would say in the West and especially in German speaking countries is perceived as failure. Yeah? So uh, making errors is often perceived as a failure, often perceived as something that is not very good and that should not happen. Also remember on our school uh, assignments, we always get everything that, that we do bad. But trial and error is a very vital part of learning new things and also leaving your comfort zone. And leaving the comfort zone is really an approach to innovation that is basic. A circle concept of progress versus linear concept of progress. So a lot of times in Asia we find that progress is very circular. So you start at one end and then you go around, you see what is in the environment, you talk to lots of people, you go back, you improve. Whereas in the West, we oftentimes have this very linear concept. Also in project management, we call it waterfall system, right? So you have step one, then step two, then step three, right? Everything has to be nice and linear. The Chinese system is more the circular one. And probably most of you have already thought already while I was speaking, this is very similar to uh, successful startups. Yeah? Actually, startups are employing exactly this model that Chinese culture is inherently propagating, the model of circular development, the model of agile starting, the model of trial and error, a lot of testing, 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 and very pragmatic approaches. I also really like these uh, illustrations. Maybe some of you know it, uh, East meets West, it is called. And I think that they depict very well concepts in pictures. Um, here, I would like to use this picture to depict the difference between circular thinking and networks versus linear thinking and networks. So we have on the left side in the blue uh, button, we see the, the rather Western concept or rather I would say German speaking. I think Spanish are also already working differently where you have a very linear concept. You want to get from A to B and you draw a line and that's it, and then you have arrived where you want it, um, that's great, right? So again, if we put it to businesses or digitalization, you only work on the project until you arrived, and then it's great, it's fine. Whereas the Chinese way of thinking is very network, yeah? You have a lot of different opportunities, also, of course, based on a lot of different contexts. The networking is extremely strong. The influence that, the, that everybody has on everybody is extremely strong, and people, actively look for that. They actively look for more ways to do things, for more ways to make it possible. If we look at marketing in the West, you usually are told, find your USP, go into the market very sharply, find only one thing that you're good in, and then do this and do only this. This is completely opposite to the Chinese model. The Chinese model is try to do as much as possible, try to employ your resources and your, your connections and what you have as broadly as possible, because we never know what happens. We never know what change comes along. We never know how we will have to adapt and how this will be a benefit for us, right? If we also look at culture uh, itself, I use this from Hofstede Insights. He draws up culture maps, which I find very helpful to illustrate uh, a very basic point. We start with Uncertainty avoidance, if we look at that, that means how comfortable is a society with uncertainty? How much do we like uncertainty? We see that for Germany, uncertainty avoidance is super high. It's a bit less than for Austria, but still. We don't like uncertainty. Austria likes uncertainty even less. As a society, we like insurances, we like to have our titles, we like to have our lives planned out in the general concept. Also businesses, they want to have long-term plans and they want to be on the safe side. They want to play it safely. If you look at the Chinese, the red color, they don't have that much of a problem with it. They're like, oh, certainty is fine. It's, it's part of life. It's not like I love it, but it's there and I'm going to employ it to my benefit. This is a cultural mindset that extremely favors innovation. 
If we look on the other hand for long-term orientation, as you can see, the blue and the red are almost the same. So it means that both countries, Austria is also almost the same. I'm sorry I employed the German numbers, but Austria is almost the same. So if we look, we all want long-term success. The approach is different. We all want to be successful and to have a, a successful digitalization transformation to go the next steps to create the future of the, the world of the future. But we don't like to adapt too much in the West. Yeah, We want to, to have it all planned out. Whereas the Chinese are like, okay, I'm going to take what I can find and I'm going to employ again. You remember the networking. I'm going to employ all the different opportunities and resources that I have so that I can reach this long-term orientation, this long-term goal. And this is something that I teach the companies that I work with uh, like <laughs> constantly the, because they are struggling with the paradox on or like the difference between long-term planning and flexibility. Why is everything changing so quickly? There are two Chinese proverbs um, that are, are expressing just that, performing 10,000 changes in order not to change the goal, the ultimate goal. Or... In, oh, I'm sorry, this is the German version, um, changing in the outside, but not changing in your essence. And that explains it very, very nicely. So we all have this long-term planning, but we, the Chinese culture gives this flexibility, this adaptation, this love for innovation that sometimes we lack. And what does that sound like? That sounds exactly like agile management, right? You have a combination of long-term and flexibility, you have the methods, I have just told you, a lot of trial and error, minimum viable product, testing, you do some detours, you find some shortcuts. It's not linear, it doesn't have to be linear. Minimum viable products, again, if we take, for example, WeChat and trial formats, if you look, for example, at the special economic zones, they're just that, they are tri trial formats to try out how does it work for a country if we do this. How does, what happens if we do that? Yeah? What could we improve to gain this and that results? And they do it on a nationwide scale as well. The social credit system was also introduced like that. Every province had a different, a slightly different system and they tried it out. They had a minimal viable product, tried out what happens, what works, what doesn't work. In the end, they all brought it together and included it into the system. So errors are expected. Yeah, learnings are expected. Nobody plans the social credit system and then rolls it out for whole China, hoping that the 20 years of analysis will hopefully work. And the last is, there are no problems. There are only other ways to the goal. I find this a very, very positive view on the world. So if we use agile management as a model to combine the two virtues of the both sides, because both sides have their virtues. And I think especially for digitalization, we can have to em employ both. We have to employ the flexibility, yeah? take the risk of embarking on the Chinese speed, risk making mistakes, risk using them as an insight, seeing it positively, and on the other side, using the structure because also the Chinese side really appreciates the attention to detail, the quality, the endless improvement until something really fits that we have, especially in German speaking countries, especially also in Austria. Um, but putting them together, right? Not risking that uh, the, the, the whole concept of uh, we need to get it absolutely perfectly hinders you to even start. Yeah? This is what startups are teaching us very well as well. They do employ this mindset. So how can we learn from this? Agility instead of perfection. Nobody needs perfection, especially not at the beginning, especially not if it means that we don't do anything at all. And if you're working in the market, right, which most of my customers are, adapt to some of the China speed. Expect it to be very agile. Focus more on the long-term goal than on obstacles and analysis. Focus on what do you have together? What do you share, for example, with a Chinese partner? Where is the market going? How can you fit in there? For yourself as a developing company, for example, if you work in development, focus on the long-term goal and stay as flexible as possible by employing, for example, agile management. Whether you call it like that or not is a different matter. We know Scrum is 
being widely used but not widely really adapted. But this staying flexible is something we can really learn from Chinese companies. They're more to test, they're more to be imperfect, use more communication. This is something we can really learn from the Chinese. And I would like to end the presentation with a quote from Elon Musk. Also, I, I saw it today or something to wrap up the whole topic. He thinks that the American work ethic is alive and well in China. Right. So he praised the word work ethic of Chinese manufacturers. They will, they, he said that they will help the country produce some very strong companies in the near futures. He also keeps stressing that few realize that China is leading the world, for example, in renewable energy generation and electric vehicles. That is simply a fact. So again, we can see that even the world's most famous innovator and disruptor from, uh, from the technological point of view is more and more looking in the direction of China, more and more trying to see what they are doing and getting his inspiration there. So with this, I would like to thank you for your patience at the beginning for the technological issues. Thank you for your attention. Uh, let's stay in touch. This is my uh, WeChat and LinkedIn QR code. You're very welcome to add me and to follow me on more insights. Whatever question you have, I'm very happy to answer them or let's have a discussion, whatever is planned, dear Yiting. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Han, so, so much. As you know, I'm Chinese, originally from China, so I'm super familiar with the topics you're talking about. And also, Ping An, it's the insurance that I got <laughs> in China. <laughs> WeChat, yeah, everyone, we must to live with WeChat nowadays, especially yeah. after the pandemic, especially yeah. after you finish the PCR test, you even got the results from WeChat. Yeah by the very simplest way you scan the code and you do the registration yeah. and then you can just go to the hospital to do a PCR test. So I want to ask a question. So um, what would you say what China can learn from Europe? I mean, by more mutual way or what can mm -hmm. two sides or two regions learn from each other? So as I have already said, I think what we can learn from each other is to integrate the flexibility and the structure to integrate the perfectionism that we really have. We are really, really good. Europe is great at analyzing things. We are really good at sustainable, especially we're talking about Austria. I have, uh, I have worked for 14 years in Austrian politics in Vienna. Austria is one of the world leaders in green tech, for example, in culture tech. We are so good at providing very high quality, sustainable things. Austria especially is one of the world leaders for circular economy. Yeah? This is something that is still missing in the Chinese mindset. So what happens after I bought the whole thing, right? So what happens to make it, how can I provide products that are really sustainable? How can I integrate it into this flexible system? Um, so these are really thing, getting the analysis right, providing sustainable solutions. We already have it in the green economy, but still some of the materials are, for example, not so sustainable. And getting the life cycle management into the whole thing, because if the Chinese mass market expands even more, we know that the middle class is already, has already grown so much, but it will grow even more because even more people are, are, are leaving poverty and we're super happy about that. But that means life cycle management is so important. If people buy things and then throw them away after half a year, that's going to be a huge problem, not only for China, but for the whole world. So this is something I believe we can learn from each other. I would say it also depends on the educational, like the level of the people, what they learn from other people or about the society environment. Mm -hmm. And I would say the people around me, my Chinese friend, they are increasing their awareness of sustainability more and more. Yeah. Because sometimes you even got punishment. If, for example, in Shanghai, where my hometown, you will got punishment if you don't do the uh, trash sorting or you just yeah. throw all the trash, like in German way or Austrian way. So yeah. at least we are trying to. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to okay. keep On the individual level, I'm absolutely sure. I'm talking, for example, um, if you think of uh, houses, building houses, houses are frequently built without a large sustainability issue in mind. So for example, we have companies from Austria that specialize in material that dampen the vibration from metros on the housing. That means with very simple ways, you can increase the, the, the longitude of how long you can use the house because mm -hmm. the vibrations don't hurt it by up to four times. So this is something where the life cycle management it's, or the sustainability comes in, where you improve things that you provide by 
easy means for the general public, right? Because the housing, the individuals is difficult to, to take part in that, for example. And this is increasingly uh, being put into action in China. And this is where we can really cooperate. Lots of Austrian companies are very successful with these kinds of offers there. So I think we got a question from yes. Mr. Akapro-Wold. So might he just turn out the mic to ask? I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I'm sorry if I pronounced it incorrectly. I cannot hear you, Mr. Gebravold. Maybe you can unmute yourself. I'm not sure if that's possible here. Yeah, I think it's possible. You just need to um, change the situation of the audio. Mr. Kipperwood, you'd better to um, disconnect your audio and reconnect it with Mike again. Take your time, it's fine. <laughs> I had the same problem earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Or if you want, you can type the question in the public chat and I can. Yeah, I think the whole topic is super interesting. So I was really, really glad to, to be able to contribute something because this whole learning from each other is such an important topic that you addressed with this year's uh, yes conference because it was it used to be very uni unidirectional right and i think that we can learn so much from each other and increase the wealth of our knowledge and the innovation not only learning one system but learning also the cultural approaches to okay we could also do it like that and we see that for example for startups this is so so successful and also in agile management mm -hmm. i'm sorry that's yeah, fine so mr keeper wrote and then You're also welcome, Mr. Gibbold. If it's not working, please add me on WeChat or LinkedIn. Ah, he's coming. Hello. And after there is also fine. That's the reason why we choose this topic for the conference this year, because we want to set uh, a bridge or the connection yeah. between EU and the Asia. Yeah. Because nowadays, I would say, especially after the pandemic, the people are yeah. getting more easy to be stereotyped or to be influenced yeah. by the external environments. So yeah. it's getting crucial to know each other better, not only from the cultural part, but also from the technology, technology yeah. part. And Absolutely. as we MCIT management communication, IT, we wanted to know what is happening on another corner of the world and what's going on, what we can learn from yeah. each other and we can, what we can improve from each other. Okay. okay, so maybe, hello. Oh, he's here. Can we? No. <laughs> Just one second. <laughs> Again, if not, you can add me on LinkedIn and ask a question there, no problem. <laughs> if it's not working for whatever reason. <laughs> Is it still uh, working, Mr. Kapuru? It should. Okay, I saw. He, I see he's typing. Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I think um, you can ask Mr. Hannes afterwards through WeChat or LinkedIn and have a deeper conversation. Exactly. You're very welcome, every, all the participants. Thank you so, so much, Mrs. Hannes. And this was my first time to see you. <laughs> I'm also super happy. Thank you for the nice moderation, for the invitation. I'm looking forward to hearing the rest who are more digitalization itself experts and looking forward to interesting case studies and see if what I have told you makes sense or doesn't. I mean, it's a discussion after all. Everything is, culture is fluent. <laughs> yeah, culture is complex, has to, complex to understand, actually. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. All and the best. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye-bye.
thanks for Mrs. Hanis for sharing, sharing her unique and special points of view with us. So in the next sessions, we have prepared two conferences room for you. The speakers are dear Philip Vastian and dear Danila Borowski. You can choose either one of the room to listen to according to your interest and flexibility. Hello, Philip.